I'm going to be presenting on this afternoon is uh, regarding a key 20th century uh, scientist, mathematician, engineer, Norbert Wiener. Uh, perhaps I might just begin by asking who in, who in the room has heard of Norbert Wiener? Okay, that's, that's better than... That's better than average. Uh, but even there I notice it's people who have direct life experience with the work that he did who are more likely to put their hands up, uh, whereas younger people who would be expected to learn of him from his, uh, from his works uh, tend to be less aware of, of those works. So the challenge that I want to look at today is, is one that he described in, in one of his writings. And I'll give a little bit of a description of him uh, in a couple of slides' time. But basically, he developed an area called cybernetics, which is the cyber and cyberspace uh, from Gibson, Gibson uh, science fiction writer, uh, made, his, uh, made the name of his work famous. Um, and the challenge that he described in um, the human use of human beings, which was the uh, popularization of, uh, of his work after cybernetics, the book itself, which was heavily mathematical, had been a, a roaring success, uh, was, was this, and this was in 1950. He said, we have modified our environment so radically that we must now modify ourselves in order to exist in this new environment. And for Norbert Wien, when he talks about modification, he's talking about modification in, in every possible way. The challenge, the difficulty with this, however, is that although we have a responsibility and a necessity to do this, uh, there is a problem with the, uh, the willingness of science to take on this challenge. And he says, in the field of science, it is perilous to run counter to the accepted tables of precedence. On no account is it permissible to mention living beings and machines in the same breath. So he's writing this in 1964. Living beings are living beings in all their parts, while machines are made of metal and other unorganised substances. These, are, these are, of course, aren't true, but they, these are the generalisations he's making. If we adhere to all these taboos, we may acquire a great reputation as conservative and sound thinkers, but we shall contribute very little to the further advance of knowledge. And Norbert Wiener was nothing if not willing to advance, the, um, uh, to advance knowledge. And one of his points of principle was that it is unforgivable to back away from a theoretical question because you think it's an unpleasant question or an unpopular question. You may back away from it because you don't think you're going to be successful or because you think it's trivial or because it's not in your main area of work, but you shouldn't avoid research simply because you, you believe the results are going to be unpalatable. So it's, it was in the 1930s that Norbert Wiener, founder of cybernetics, began building a bridge between the medical and engineering sciences. Over the following 30 years, his life uh, sciences work included neural, ethical, social, prosthetic, and other dimensions. And just putting those things together makes you realise that he was, he was a fairly unusual thinker. Usually people don't cross disciplinary boundaries like that. His groundbreaking work, Cybernetics, was subtitled Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. And in this he looked at both the perspective, the prospects and threats faced by humanity and its increasingly complex relationship with machines. So I'd just like to give you a little bit of a background to, to the person himself. Uh, he was a child prodigy, so he finished his PhD when he was 18 or 19 and in 19 started postdoctoral study under Bertrand Russell. He'd actually, the uh, logician, he had actually done his dissertation on the first volume of Russell's, or first volumes of Russell's Principia. He made his reputation as a mathematician, um, and he's still known to engineers through uh, through the name of some of the things he developed, the Wiener filter and the Wiener measure. So engineers in general will run across the name without under having any understanding of where it comes from or even in which century the work was done. He became a prominent scientist in the systems and control field and alongside Claude Shannon, a major contributor to the foundation of modern information theory. And I'll speak a little bit about that later. He helped transform MIT from a school for engineers to a world leader in science and engineering fields. In 1948, he invented cybernetics. 
Uh, in also 1948, he became noted for his opposition to weapons development after his 1948 statement, "The Scientist Rebels." In particular, he looked very he looked uh, very dismally on scientists who were attracted by prestige and money to go into um, secretive weapons development. Uh, his automated world became the subject of Kurt Vonnegut's first science fiction writing, Play a Piano. And today his work is little known to the present generation. Even for those who are familiar with names such as Vannevar Bush, Alan Turing, Claude Shannon and John von Neumann. Uh, so part of one of the reasons that I'm uh, focusing on this work is to try to correct that, uh, that historical black hole that he's, that he's fallen into. Now the, the tools with that uh, rather varied background, so it's a very solid background in mathematics and science and in engineering, uh, a world leader in each of those fields, uh, he, his uh, approach to things was very multidisciplinary. He, uh, and this was for various reasons, partly it was uh, intellectual, so he said the most, for himself, the most fruitful areas uh, for the growth of the sciences were those which had been neglected as no man's land between the various established fields. And I'd, I'd just like, I've just picked out a couple of uh, quotes from him about his view of the way scientists today, well, in the mid uh, 20th century and still today, observe the boundaries of their fields. So in one case he said, each member travels a pre-assigned path uh, and in which the sentinels of science, when they um, and, oh, sorry, and in which the sentinels of science, when they come to the end of their beats, present arms, do an about face, and march back in the direction from which they have come. So you, you think of a lot of scientists are like that. They get to the they get to their boundary, and then they walk back. And he even personalises it further. He says, a scientist will regard the next subject, that is the subject in the related field of theirs, as something belonging to his colleague three doors down the corridor and will consider any interest in it on his behalf as an unwarrantable breach of privacy. Which I think is a fantastic description. If you can think of all of those scientists and all of those universities across the world who were refusing to think outside of their boundaries, and it is almost like it would be a breach of privacy of their colleagues for them to think about anything outside of their own specialised field. Now, Wiener's definition of multidisciplinarianism is a lot stronger than modern current usage. So if, if I were to put together a multidisciplinary team, it would probably mean I'd have a, for example, I might have a, um, a, a technologist, a project manager, a usability expert, um, a, uh, a testing person, um, an anthropologist, uh, and I'd work on the next iPod. That's, that's multidisciplinary from, that's what a multidisciplinary approach is, uh, tends to be these days. This was much more exacting. He said, the mathematician need not have the skill to conduct a, a physiological experiment, but he must have the skill to understand one, to criticise one and to suggest one. The, psych the physiologist need not be able to prove a certain mathematical theorem, but he must be able to grasp its physiological significance and to tell the mathematician for what he should look. So this is an idea that, from a multidisciplinary point of view, it's not just that you don't mind sitting in a meeting with somebody from a dis different discipline, but you actually have a very good understanding, a very good technical understanding uh, of those other fields, so that you can usefully interact between those fields. Now, throughout his life, he pulled together multidisciplinary teams. And I've just got a few examples here. This is really quite important because a lot of this, a lot of these um, ad hoc approaches he took then accident, almost accidentally led to the life sciences work that he undertook. Um, so from the from the mid thirties, he was involved closely with Arturo Rosenblatt, a Mexican neurophysiologist. Now that, this is actually quite interesting. Norbert Wiener, while he was based in the US, spent large amounts of time, approximately six months of each two years, lecturing somewhere foreign. Um, this was in the uh, 40s and 50s. And through, through the mid-50s, he spent a lot of, he spent six months of every two years lecturing in Mexico, for example. Uh, he spent a lot of time lecturing in India, in, he lectured in China, in Japan, 
um, sometime in Europe, although not so much. But he, he spent a huge amount of time speaking with and communicating with uh, cultures that were very different to the standard North American uh, science world. He's um, Julian Bigelow, uh, the key collaborator of Wiener on feedback, and this is he worked with Wiener's, Wiener in his physics work in the 1930s, where they were he developed his theory of feedback through um, actually military uh, investigation, looking at predictive means of um, target tracking uh, for anti-aircraft fire, um, and uh, Bigelow later went on to work with von Neumann on on the Wiener's uh, recommendation, which itself is interesting if you know anything about the history of, um, of physicists and scientists in the 20th century. Von Neumann is very much a, a very enthusiastic militarist, um, who in fact eventually died from uh, radiation poisoning uh, that he received while engaged in nuclear testing, um, as opposed to Wiener, who was very much opposed to um, the development of nuclear weapons. Cybernetics itself emerged out of a multidisciplinary discussion uh, sponsored by the Macy Foundation in New York. These commenced, uh, there were several of these, they commenced in 1942 and they involved psych, um, psychologists, physiologists, social scientists, mathematicians, engineers and physicists, which is a fairly unusual uh, group of people. And these were people brought together to discuss, each other, to discuss their own fields and look at learnings from their own fields that could be applied. Um, and not very indirectly, but rather quite directly to other fields, uh, which was very important because if, unless you actually get people together, they don't realise that they may be talking about the same subject using a completely different set of language. Uh, and that was, the, that was the benefit of the Macy, um, um, uh, the Macy meetings that were held uh, from 42 up until 47, 6 or 7 or 8, I think. Claude Shannon wrote that Claude Shannon, who's the generally um, considered to be the inventor of modern digital um, um, information theory, uh, wrote that communication theory is uh, heavily indebted to Wiener for much of his basic philosophy and theory. And in fact, um, uh, Shannon and Wiener had many, many conversations in the period leading up to Shannon developing his, his own theory, his key theory. Wiener made multiple visits to India in the 1950s at the invitation of uh, Nehru, the, uh, the Indian leader, and uh, Prasanta Chandra Mahalanobis, founder of the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata. Uh, and this is very interesting. Anyone, who's in anyone who is interested in the history of, of scientific ideas in the 20th century, would, um, I definitely encourage you to look at the work of the Indian Statistical Institute. Uh, I, was, I was fortunate to be there uh, a few weeks ago and went through the archives um, and, and looked at, uh, at Wiener's um, involvement there. It's very, it's very inspirational and particularly the leader of that institute had a major impact and encouraged other people and drew on them to, have, to, have, to help create the modern IT industry that exists in India today. It's not just accidental, it wouldn't have just come out of foreign investment in Indian, uh, in Indian technology. Uh, four key collaborators. Uh, I, I've just listed uh, four co-authors of a paper, What the Frog Side Tells the Frog's Brain, from 1959, which was a groundbreaking work changing the, uh, the consideration of the relationship between perception and cognition. And when you think about those from a, if anyone from a, who, who can think of those from a um, by a scientist's point of view, those are also very much very philosophical questions. The question of perception and cognition are uh, very central to any theory, any philosophical theories of science. Uh, so that that work was also interesting. And if you follow those people through, the um, Umberto uh, Maturana, for example, was then one of the key people involved in engaging. Um, uh, a, a researcher from the UK, uh, Stafford Beer, to develop in, um, in the early 1970s within Chile to develop a cybernetic system to try to assist in the development of the Chilean economy, which was very, very out there and experimental and only possible because of the flexibility of attitude of the Allende government of, of the time. 
in the life sciences. So, so where did this huge diversity of experience, this huge diversity of, um, of collaboration and his multidisciplinary approach, where did it take us? Now, I've, only, I've just picked out two different, two different points, and I'm not going to say for a moment that the things that, were, the things that Norbert Wiener was working on 70 years ago, 70 or 75 years ago, um, are, uh, are going to tell us about the state of technology today. But it is interesting to know how far back many of the ideas today that, we, that people think about were already, uh, already being worked on uh, through, through Wiener's work. So in the first case, in the first case, we're talking about people who people with disabilities, people who, who will lose who lose either their hearing or their sight um, due to some sort of brain damage. And and what he's talking about here is the flexibility of the plasticity. What I guess you would call these days the plasticity, the learning plasticity of the brain. Um, and he 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 reduces he he presents it in in fairly uh, straightforward engineering terms. So he talks about. Um, the, the auditory cortex, if the auditory cortex we use for vision, we'd expect to get a quantity of reception of information about 1% of that coming through the eye. So he's, he's applying his theories of information, his theory, his understanding of, uh, of brain functioning, and his engineering approach to say, okay, well, the brain, uh, the hearing uses about, hearing uses about 1% of the capacity of, of Eyesight. Therefore, if you use the hearing part of the brain for, for as a uh, as a way of replacing eyesight, you'd still be, you'd get a very small amount, but you'd still get some functional amount of, uh, of functioning for the person. And if you, if you did it the other way around, if the hearing um, if the areas of the brain that provided hearing uh, or that, that supported hearing were were injured, and you were able to uh, re reposition that within the areas of the brain working on um, sight. Uh, you'd get an almost imperceptible uh, impact on, on sight because sight uses so much more, um, uh, um, so much more information, processes so much more information. Um, that's the problem of sensory prosthesis is an extremely hopeful field of work. Uh, and I would actually venture to say that's still a, um, much, of, much of the stuff he, he described simply couldn't be developed in the 50s and 60s. And it was only in the last 20 years that we've started getting the the the, um, the tools and the knowledge to to try, uh, attempt some of these uh, approaches. Uh, another, a more straightforward example, uh, looking at traditional prosthetics, and he talks about um, the loss of a segment of a limb implies not only the loss of the purely passive support, um, it's mechanical uh, and a mechanical extension of the stump. Um, but, and loss of uh, power of muscles, but it implies the loss of oh, um, uh, cutaneous and kinesthetic sensations originating in it. The first two losses are what artificial limb makers have uh, now, what the artificial limb maker now tries to replace. So this is looking, going back hundreds of years. Um, the third has so far been beyond his scope. Uh, now within, in the 1960s, uh, Wiener himself worked on something called the Boston Arm. I think it was 1963, he was just accidentally in hospital following a fall. And he was able to assist with the development of the Boston Arm, which was the, uh, as, as I understand it, the first use of remaining, um, um, remaining bits to uh, control, to, um, to provide feedback and sensory information to a person. Um, remaining nerve sensors and, and other parts. So that was, this is um, a long time ago. This is over, this is 50 years ago that this work, or 60 or so years ago the work was being thought of, and 50 years ago that the work was actually uh, begun to be undertaken. And obviously today a lot of work is, uh, a lot of prosthetics work has advanced tremendously since then. But it is on that early foundation. The, then we go a little bit further and we talk about the human-machine continuum. Um, and this jumps back to Wiener's comment about you can't talk about the living and the machine in the same terms. And it was uh, a rule that he obviously broke all of the time. 
Uh, so a very simple case. In the ear, the transposition of music from one fundamental pitch to another is nothing but a translation of the logarithm of the frequency and thus, uh, and may consequently be performed by a group scanning apparatus. So for him it was, yep, you can do that. Um, a, a bit more of a, uh, a complex example, our inner economy must contain an assembly of thermostats, automated hydrogen ion concentration controls, governors, and the like, which would be adequate for a great chemical plant. These are what we know collectively as our homeostatic mechanism. So at the end, there's a lot of, uh, if you can describe it in mechanical terms, why not? Why pretend there are differences when there aren't? This isn't to say that you can reduce a human being down to um, uh, deterministic machine states. He was, he was, um, he didn't have a deterministic view of science, um, and he didn't approach it that way. But he did make the point that many of the things that you can observe in machines, especially in relation to feedback, you can actually, you can also observe in relation to people, and the knowledge you can learn from machines can assist in uh, addressing the problems of the people. Um, so he says, it's my thesis that the physical functioning of the living individual and the operation of some of the newer communication machines are precisely par parallel in their analogous attempts to control entropy through feedback. He also, and I'll talk, speak a little bit about entropy on the next slide. He also, and people would say to him, how can you reduce people to machines? How can you say a person is just a machine? Which isn't what he said, but just a lot of people were outraged at the idea that you could make any connection whatsoever. But he also turned that analogy on his head and he said, okay, so when is a person a machine? And he gave the, he said, um, when human atoms, that is individual people, are knit into an organisation in which they are used, not in their full right as responsible human beings, but as cogs and levers and rods, it mat matters little that their raw material is flesh and blood, in flesh and blood. What is used as an element in a machine is, in fact, an element in the machine. Which is, a, I think it's a, an interesting way to look at that, to, to throw it back at people who say, people aren't machines, you can't call people machines. To say, you look at a lot of organisations today, people are simply cogs in a machine. I mentioned entropy, and it's interesting, um, Norbert Wiener had a, a non-deterministic view of uh, external realities. He saw, now, he saw information and entropy as opposite ends of a continuum. And this is something that which I haven't run across. Uh, it's, it's definitely there in Wiener, and I haven't seen that widely considered in other discussions. Um, in this, his focus um, is on philosophical questions. He makes the point, information is information, not matter, not matter or energy. Now, what does that mean for somebody with a view? You, you, can, you can't create or destroy um, matter slash energy. We all, we all understand energy slash matter. We, we understand how that works in the universe. And he's saying information is not matter or energy. So that's a, that's a, a little bit of a um, rather big statement in relation to uh, philosophy of science. And what he says is it's the opposite of entropy. And when you think about it, you can say, well, yeah, entropy isn't matter or uh, energy. Entropy is the, dis the distribution of energy. Sorry, entropy is uh, entropy. For those who aren't familiar with it, is uh, is the tendency as uh, energy changes form for energy to end up as heat. So that's the um, it's the second law of thermodynamics developed in the I think it was the 1860s. Uh, now he didn't avoid straying into the controversy <coughs> and. Uh, he talks about one thing: if you have a heat death theory of the universe, you have a very you can have a very pessimistic outlook. So it's the idea that everything's going to heat, everything's dying. What's the point of anything? Entropy is the is the force of the universe. We're all winding down. Why bother getting out of bed in the morning? Uh, now his his view is uh, there are certain uh, analogies of behaviour being observed between the machine and the living organism. Um, the problem as to whether the machine is alive or not is, for our purposes, semantic. Now that's a pretty dramatic, that's a pretty uh, drastic statement. It, it uh, certainly gets, it certainly puts to one side a whole lot of debate over whether humans, uh, whether machines will uh, in the future be sentient. He says, this is just semantic. 
Um, if we wish to use the word life to cover all phenomena which locally swim, up, swim upstream against the current of increasing entropy, we are at liberty to do so. So this is his idea. Information, information is something that's created by life. Information is something that can be created by, by machines. Machines can be designed in such a way that they um, increase order. Uh, this, is, this was his philosophical approach. Uh, more generally, there are local and temporary islands of decreasing entropy in a world in which the entropy as a whole tends to increase. And the existence of these, little, of these islands enable some of us to assert the existence of progress. And that was his view. His, his view was, has anybody heard the concept of Maxwell's demon? Right. So his comment about Maxwell's demon is, is if you want Maxwell's demon, look at life. Look at, look, at, look at the way chlorophyll works. It's Maxwell's demon. It creates order out of chaos. It orders chaos. Now, that's a, there's a, a big argument. I don't want to get into a long argument about that, that but that's, I'm just saying that's, uh, that's a fairly... Uh, he, he puts forward some pretty simple answers to some pretty complex problems, and when you drill down into the simple answers, they're substantial. They're not uh, trivial. Um, having said that, he wasn't a he, he wasn't an avid fan of uh, progress, as in bigger, better, use more, and so on. And he makes a very in one of his uh, writings, he makes a very humorous comparison to between environmental destruction and the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. So, if you remember, the, in the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, the, the Mad Hatter and the uh, March Hare move from once to the they just move from one seat to another, and when they've finished all the food in, in one sitting, they move around to the next uh, sitting, and, and they have another uh, lunch or tea party, another tea. Uh, and he, when, uh, when Alice asks them what is going to happen when they get to the end of the table and they use up all the settings, they change the subject. And for him, that's the that's the us using the resources of the world is like is like that. So he's very forward looking on a, on a lot of the questions that are now plaguing the world. So I'd like to uh, finish with a couple of sets of conclusions. One is um, limiting and others non-limiting possibilities. Wiener identified several limits to his work. Firstly, um, in, terms of, in terms of understanding the brain, uh, Wiener, had, Wiener criticized Shannon for being excessively digital. Uh, Wiener, in his own prejudices, I think was more analog than digital. Um, if that doesn't make any sense to you, then it just means you haven't been indoctrinated in analog and digital approaches to information. But if you have, that's the um, that's where he sat. Um, he said so. He, he says that um, machines that measure, it, as opposed to machines that count, are very greatly limited in their precision. So a machine that measures is an analog machine. A machine that counts is a digital machine. Um, Add to this the prejudices of the physiologist in favour of one or none action, and we see why the greater part of the work which has been done on the mechanical uh, simulacra of the brain has been on machines which are more or less on a digital basis. So he's saying most work, and that continues today, most of the AI work is uh, digital, I would think. I, I'm, I'm not a specialist in that area. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't defend that thesis, but I, it's just my understanding. Uh, however, however, if we insist too strongly on the brain as a glorified digital machine, we shall be subject to some very just criticism, and that's from both physiologists themselves and from psychologists. Uh, on the so that's that's a limitation. We don't we do not think people aren't machines in the sense that you could simply construct it in the sense that the um, uh, the mechanists, the 17th century mechanists, would think of people as machines. Um, purely the, the, the people who base themselves purely on uh, Newtonian physics. On the application, on the application of his work to social sciences, sciences, he gives a different warning, which is the human sciences are very poor testing grounds for a new mathematical technique, that is cybernetics. Um, as poor as the statistical mechanics of a gas would be to a being of the order of size of a molecule. So, if you can think of a bunch of things. Um, um, sentient things that are the size of a molecule, um, the laws of the, the gas laws wouldn't be very helpful to them. Um, because uh, 
turn the fluctuations which we ignore from a larger standpoint would be precisely the matters of greatest importance. He also places, uh, sorry, in addition to practical limits, he identifies uh, limits we should impose, including on weapons development and automation. The first one is very interesting. He says, there is no distinction between arming ourselves and arming our enemies. And that, what, what he means there is, if somebody, supposing somebody in some country in the world today discovered some great new weapon, a very, very destruct, destructive weapon, as soon as the knowledge of that weapon is out, it's very simple, trivially simple for any other, for any other very, very powerful and um, well-funded state to duplicate that weapon. Which means every time you invent a weapon, you're actually handing it simultaneously with inventing it. No matter how secret you are, you're simultaneously handing it over to you to um, uh, arming our enemies, as he puts it. The other point beyond, uh, in addition to uh, the weapons industry, he looked at, he said, long before Nagasaki and the public awareness of the atomic bomb, it had occurred to me that we were here in the presence of another socially, a social potentiality of unheard of importance for good and evil, the, automat the automatic factory in the assembly line without human agents. Uh, and since it was Norbert, Norbert Wiener's work which laid the basis for factory automation, that's where his mathematics, uh, that's what his mathematics produced, um, it's very unusual for somebody who's involved in such a technical revolution to spend so much time thinking about the consequences of that technical revolution. Uh, for example, he approached both the uh, labor organized union organizations and both union organizations and uh, employer organizations to say, look, you've got to understand this is very dangerous. What's happening at the moment is uh, what we're, on, what we're on the edge of is creating a world where, with infinite production and nobody working. And this is going to have huge uh, impact. Now, that, the world didn't quite turn out like that. And there is an argument that that was partly because of the awareness of, of his argument. Um, that's, I, won't, I, won't take, I won't argue one way or another on that. Um, but if you, if you have read Play a Piano, the Kurt Vonnegut um, novel, uh, you'll be, you'll have that picture in mind. On the other side, the unlimited possibilities. This is quite, I find this quite interesting. While addressing societal concerns, as I, as I just have on the previous slide, he looked at the capacity of humans to manage their affairs and technology. Uh, and I've given two examples of this. Uh, Thus there is a new engineering of process, processes that's possible, the one I described before, and it will involve the construction of systems of a mixed nature involving both human and mechanical parts. However, this type of engineering need not be confined to the replacement of parts that we've lost. There is a process of parts which we do not have and which we have never had. So he gives the example there of processes to, to give uh, humans the capacity to swim like dolphins. Um, and uh, the final example, um, and I, I think this one's quite interesting, we're in a place to know no theoretical limit on human transformation whatsoever. Uh, it is conceptually possible for a human being to be sent over a telegraph line. At present, and perhaps for the whole existence of the human race, the idea is impractical. But it is not on that account inconceivable. This is the mathemat mathematician and information theorist speaking. Quite apart from the difficulties of bringing this notion into practice in the case of man, it is a thoroughly realizable concept in the case of the man-made machines of a lower degree of complexity. So that's, um, that's an interesting uh, one to contemplate. Kind of, that's actually an idea that's been picked up by quite a few science fiction writers since then. But this, is, um, this was writing um, 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago. Now, for people, if you want more information about Norbert Wiener, there's, there are quite a few, there's quite a, a good range of information out there, but unfortunately, most of it is out of print. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, I've identified the, uh, the key ones that I recommend. The first of these from uh, John von Neumann and Norbert Wiener, Norbert Wiener from Mathematics to Technologies of Life and Death by Steve Himes. Um, this is interesting because he actually contrasts the two, the two who are quite good collaborators, quite close collaborators. As I mentioned, um, uh, Bigelow went from went to work for von Neumann on the recommendation of Wiener. Um, but they ended up in very different places. So um, von Neumann ended up um, 
uh, his, his name was pretty well completely blackened by uh, when, he, when he engaged in, um, he was the head of the US Atomic Energy um, Organization at the time and engaged in witch hunting against um, a professional opponent and I don't think he ever, his reputation ever recovered from that. Um, Norbert Wiener was uh, very much opposed to control in science and went out of his way to block witch hunting and to encourage scientists, scientists to be able to develop their work free of uh, political pressure. Um, the second one, uh, Norbert Wiener, uh, 1894-1964 by Masini Masani, um, is a very good mathematical explanation. It's written by a long, his longtime collaborator who co-edited Wiener's collected collected works with Wiener in the last years of Wiener's life and continued that work after Wiener's death. Uh, and that's a good, uh, that's uh, very informative. Uh, the third one I've listed here, Dark Hero of the Information Age in Search of Norbert Wiener, Father of Cybernetics by Flo Conway and Jim Siegelman. Just came out uh, about five years ago now, five or six years ago. Uh, and it addresses an aspect of Wiener which I haven't mentioned, which was his, uh, he was very, um, he was a very difficult person to work with um, and at one stage during his life managed to break relations with all of his professional colleagues and never recreated those. Um, so when you, when you read Wiener's work you've got to keep in mind that he was, um, he was a very difficult person and, and had a, had a, for that reason had a, a rather troubled life. The, uh, and then the last two, Ex Prodigy, My Childhood and Youth and I'm a Mathematician, The Later Life of a Prodigy, books by um, uh, books by Wiener. If you have any doubts about what I just said about him having a troubled life, uh, read these two biographies of him, uh, autobiographies of him, and you'll have no doubts uh, of, of what I just said. Now, a couple of other, I'll finish with a couple of other slides. Um, there's a conference on Norbert Wiener being held, it's called Norbert Wiener in the 21st Century, being held in Boston, March 2014, on the uh, 50th anniversary of his death to commemorate his, his life and work. Uh, this has been able, I'm one of the organisers of this conference and, and it's been able to draw a very prestigious uh, team of supporters. Um, Dr. Amar Bose, uh, founder of uh, the Bose Music Empire, um, the uh, Vince Surf, the co-inventor of TCPIP, co-father of the internet, um, Robert Vallet, uh, uh, chair of uh, the major cybernetics organisation, World Organisation of Systems and Cybernetics, um, Mary Catherine Bateson, the daughter of Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson, who were active participants in, in the um, Macy um, work and a, uh, a skilled anthropologist in her own right. Verna Vinge, obviously well known to everybody here. Um, Richard Stallman, president of the Free Software Foundation. Dr. Rafael Kapura, chair of the International Centre for Information Ethics. And interestingly, uh, Norbert Wiener is, is seen as the co-founder of information ethics uh, or, te or information technology ethics uh, which gives an idea of the range of his work and Flo Conway and Jim Siegelman, authors of the, of the book I just described. And I don't know if you can see it there but the, uh, there's, there's a website for the conference www.21stcenturywiener.org and there's a, a monthly newsletter, a very, very simple monthly newsletter that comes out. It's uh, just under two years away to, from the conference now, but I'd urge anybody who's interested in that to, uh, to get in touch. It's going to be, I think it's going to be very exciting, um, very good. And just to finally finish on the IEEE Society and Social Implications of Technology, it's part of the, which I'm the Australian Chair of, it's part of the 400,000 member Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. It uh, celebrates its 40th anniversary this year. Publishes Technology and Society magazine, which um, uh, Katina Michael from University of Wollongong, which some people here might, who some people here may be familiar with, um, is the editor of. Uh, we're co-sponsoring an IEEE conference on technology and society in Asia in Singapore later this year. Uh, 27 to 29 of October. Once again, urge anyone interested in in that to participate. And that has some very also has some very uh, great keynotes. We've got um, Narayan Murthy, the the founder of Infosys, 140,000 uh, staff uh, organisation. Uh, people are probably familiar with. 
also the government representative to the committee on the uh, Fukushima nuclear disaster, uh, will be speaking from Japan, and Michael Gerstein, the founder of Com Community Informatics from, from Canada. Um, and we're engaged in issues around technology, including ethics, environment, development, social responsibility, gender, and so on. So with that, I'll uh, open the floor to questions or comments. And after the break, we also have a, a panel on some of Norbert Wynn's work, so uh, there'll be a further chance for questions then. representative of MIT stood up and said there shouldn't. Um, I, as a scientist, am never going to do any more work in, uh, in weapons programs. And for that reason, and he said, and for that reason, I'm going to work, spend all my time working on the life sciences. Um, given that the major source of funding for MIT was the military, uh, has been the military for a long time. I don't know if it's still a majority, but certainly a very, a very major part of that, meant that the the people who followed his work, uh, if they followed his work strictly, they missed out on the funding grants. Uh, if you miss out on funding, enough funding grants, you disappear off the face of, off the face of things. That, that's, that's one aspect. The second aspect was, as I said, he uh, unfortunately broke all his relations with the early um, Macy uh, group. Uh, and that, that event is described thoroughly in, in Dark Hero. Uh, and so therefore lost uh, they lost impetus, and a third reason I'd say um, is that um, he's he's not a comfortable. Uh, leaving aside the, his personal characteristics, he's not a comfortable person for a modern scientist or engineer. So if somebody comes along and says, "If you're an engineer, if, if you're a scientist," and you just take big amounts of money to work on the same thing over and over again, you're crap. And that's not, a lot of scientists do that. The vast majority of scientists, one way or another, uh, do that. Mostly because they, they're not senior enough to have any choice, but a lot of the senior ones do it out of, out of choice. And if you look at, um, there's a, if you want to know how to make money as a scientist, if you really, really want to make money as a scientist today, I can tell you how. Put your hand up and say, I don't believe in global warming. It doesn't matter what your field is, okay, so geologists, geologists, I mean, what would a geologist know about climate? Geologists are all putting up their hands and saying, I don't know why global warming exists. I can't see it in the geological record. No, this is sort of utterly stupid. Um, you know, there's, been, there's trillions of tons of coal there. We don't have an environment that can produce that anymore. Obviously, we don't have the same environment we had during the Carboniferous era. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, this, this, is, this has been very well and clearly documented in a book called, uh, by Oreskes and Conway, called uh, Merchants of Doubt, uh, where they, they document the professional careers of the physicists involved in nuclear weapons development from the 1950s, and those physicists who then went on to become deniers of ozone damage, deniers of the effects of cigarette smoking, deniers of the uh, of acid rain, deniers of climate change, and these people have a, the same, the actual same individuals year after year, with, 
I mean, those things are obviously across a wide spectrum of sciences, but um, these the same people would testify in court that you know, acid rains are fake, or people, you can't get sick from smoking, you can't get sick from someone else's smoking, stuff like that. So he didn't follow the things that would have helped him be commercially successful, and he stung a few, he um, upset a few people um, on the military side, and he um, it was a little bit difficult. Okay. All right. You said that um, I, I'm actually fortunate enough to have cybernetics at home, at uh, his book. So uh, I think it's quite real now. I'm very pleased about that. The, the, um, you said that he wasn't, um, he was more interested in the analog side of of um, cybernetics, but it, the digital side immediately entered in, I think, and um, I think Shannon was involved in that as well. Um, digital lo logic gates, although they were, they were very, very cumbersome to make in those days, were immediately used. Did, did actually, uh, did Wiener follow up on that also, in the, in the digital side? Did yeah, did Wiener get involved in the, the, the digital development of cybernetic uh, yeah. uh, Wiener worked with Vannevar Bush in the 1930s on computer systems and defined... Um, he was one of the people, the people about 1937-38, who, who defined the characteristics of a digital computer. Uh, so he was no... He wasn't... Um, hostile to the idea of digital logic and digital computers and digital computing. Um, what he said was that it's, it was part of, an important part of the picture. He said it's easier to work with. So, so the point I quoted there about um, analog, it's way more difficult to build an accurate analog machine or whatever ac accurate analog means uh, than an accurate digital machine. An accurate digital machine means you're not, you're not losing bits. Um, uh, but if you, if you ignore the analog, you ignore it. Life is analog. Life isn't digital. Life is analog. And if you try to shape things like uh, brain processes and, and try to say that they're simply digital, if you try to, if you try to shoehorn everything into a digital shape, um, you're losing the diversity of life. So that's, his, that, that's the, um, the idea. Uh. Information is information, not matter or energy. Could you talk about how we conceptualise that? Sorry. Uh, information is information, not matter or energy. Um, could you talk about how we conceptualise that statement? Um, uh, so, and so, what he meant by that, or how it affected his work? What? What? Both. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, if um, it's interesting to compare the theories of uh, the, um, the mathematics of Claude Shannon and Norbert Wiener on information. Now, has, are people familiar with the book um, The Information? Yeah, it came out uh, six months ago, 12 months ago, something like that. Uh, and it presents itself, James Gleek, it presents itself as a, as a bit of an all in. Um, start to finish uh, commentary on, on what is information. It's a bit of a hodgepodge, uh, and it hates Wiener. It uses every opportunity. I think it makes about 15 criticisms of him uh, in the pro out of about 16 references to him. Um, the Shannon's view, Shannon wasn't particularly philosophical in the way that he dealt with information. So for Shannon, uh, Shannon didn't uh, consider the the question of what's the content of information, uh, a meaningful question. So for Shannon, information was the ability to convey, to reliably con convey certain things, from certain, certain bits of information from place to place. Uh, and his, uh, he, his view was that increased information, he considered entropy to be uh, more information rich than not entropy. So he sort of, he got the, the mathematics around 
the, the opposite way. And for him it didn't really matter because he wasn't looking at it philosophically, he was just looking at it from the point of view of how do we improve the quality of information flow through data communication lines. Um, and how do we, how, I'm not underestimating that, but how do we really, really do that in a very good way, you know, that all engineers still copy, but that was his interest. His interest wasn't, and what does it mean? Um, Norbert Wiener was looking more at the, what does it mean? What's the, what's the meaning of information? What's, what's it actually doing? And he, he started off his life as a philosopher, so he didn't start off as a mathematician. He, he did his PhD in philosophy. Uh, and so that, it's not surprising that he came at it from that direction. Uh, once he started thinking about it, once, once he started thinking about information, what he, what he decided was that information was the product of, uh, the ability to produce information was uh, the ability to be uh, Maxwell's demon. So the, the idea of Maxwell's demon is, if you've, got a, if you've got a room full of gas, or a box full of gas, you'll have some high energy, some high energy bits bouncing around high speed and some low energy bits. If you could have, have a wall in the middle of that box and have a little demon, a little, per, a little character in there that lets high energy bits go into one direction and low energy bits go into the other direction, over a period of time you'll build up, on one side you'll build up a, um, low energy gas molecules on one side, high energy gas molecules on another side, you will have created a potential and you'll be able to use it. Sort of sometimes presented as a perpetual motion machine. What he pointed out was that this is what life does. Life to, and, and the mechanism that it uses is feedback. So feedback is the, is the key uh, element of his work. And he described feedback, and that's, that was one of the reasons he was so keen on the similarity of processes across different um, areas. So feedback works in nature. Feedback works in a machine. Feedback works in society. Feedback works in a person. Feedback works in a person's brain. Feed, no matter what what point, which area you look at, you can see these see these feedback processes and negative what's called negative feedback, uh, which is that a little bit of the output is turned around and put back into the input in a in a process flow. So if you're an engineer, that'll make sense. If you're not an engineer, um, it doesn't. That probably won't make sense at all. But um, feed, feedback is the ability. I, I'll give you a, a better example. When I'm driving along a road. <laughs> I'm holding a steering wheel in my hand. I'm not thinking the road is going to turn to the right and therefore I'm going to steer to the right. I'm thinking I'm driving ahead and I'm driving away from where I want to be. So I'll move the steering wheel. Uh, so if I, if I pick up an object, I don't think what are all the muscles, I haven't just made subconscious all the muscle movements I have to do to pick up an object. What I've actually done is I've said the object's over there, my hand's here, I'm, I'm going to grab the object. So it's a, and, and as I move towards the object to grab it, uh, I'm using feedback to work out how far my hand is from the object, and I'm going to keep on going until I get to the object, and then I'm, I'm going to pick it up. I'm not going to keep. I'm not, it's not like a um, a robot arm where I'm just going to go do 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 do. You know, I understand that's how many steps it is. Uh, so this this idea of feedback led to his idea of information. So for him, information was very much about the increased order created by. Uh, feedback and the feedback loops, as I say, in society is nature in, 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 in humans. Um, so, having done that, he then had an answer to the question of um, he had a, a rather unusual answer to the question of the death of the universe, which, being a philosopher, is the sort of question he would have thought about, whereas someone who isn't a philosopher isn't going to worry about the heat death of the universe unless they're just sort of a worrier. Um, uh, what it meant for him was that he, he presented a lot of his ideas in terms of increase, increased information or protecting information or not gratuitous, gratuitously destroying information, not gratuitously contributing to, um, to entropy. So he constantly uses the reference to this, this stream of entropy which we're fighting against, we're moving against this stream of entropy. And in our lives, and in our, in our professions, in our mechanical work, we should not be contributing to entropy. We should be contributing to, um, to information. Excellent. I think that's all we have time for. Uh, we have a break.
And then we do have a panel which is going to be um, on Norbert Wino after this. So I understand there are a few more questions, but maybe we can save them for the panel. And uh, we have um, Stellark and Greg Adams and then Natasha Vita Moore on the next panel. And that'll be just after the break in about half an hour. So, thanks, Greg. That was an excellent